we're going to finish up uh, DC to DC converters today. We're kind of filling in a couple of extra things that I want you to know these exist. I want you to know about their topology. I want you to know their pros and cons, but we're not necessarily going to do analysis. So we're not going to necessarily be able to you know, choose capacitor and inductor values for these. Just keep in mind though, that almost all of these designs, if you chose to go with them in an actual project, you could find a candidate component, a candidate controller, and read through the data sheet for that and determine sort of their recommendations for designing the overall circuit and follow that. So not everything is, we're entering the territory where an academic discussion of these things really takes a backseat to the practical you know, the, the, the practical uh, design requirements that are set by the specific part that you're using and, and the manufacturer of that part. Probably the most popular uh, switching converter that we haven't talked about is the buck boost converter. The buck boost converter, uh, when we talked about the buck converter, it was only able to take a voltage and decrease it. When we talked about the boost converter, because the boost converter in its off state had a, just a direct line between the input and output, it's not able to actually reduce that voltage below the input. So a boost converter could only boost, a buck converter could only uh, buck, it could only drop the voltage. A buck boost converter is a type of converter that can do both. So in, in, um, in the on state, we are charging we are storing energy in this inductor the same way that we did with the boost converter. And also while we're doing that, we have this capacitor, which is still providing current to our, to our circuit. And then in the off state, that energy that was stored in the inductor, that is now passing, that is now charging this capacitor and it's powering our circuit. And the, you know, this is a fairly, straightforward design. The thing that you might find interesting is I show current feeding into the circuit this direction, which this is, this is the ground reference here, right? So that is, so the problem is we have current flowing into the terminal, which is tied to ground, which means that this voltage here, this will be less than zero volts. So this voltage of this node will actually be negative. So when we use the buck boost converter as configured like this, the nice thing is, you know, we can, we can change the duty cycle and we're able to drop the output voltage below our input voltage or increase it beyond our input voltage. But we do that at a cost of, we're essentially generating a negative voltage. Now this is really handy. One thing we can do is we can use this as simply a negative voltage rail. So we could use that node of this to produce a, a negative voltage, which we might want. Or we can basically just say, well, maybe let's just call this our ground. If we call the negative terminal ground, then our ground, what, what was our ground is now a, relative to that as a positive voltage. So I think I think I have a slide where I talk more about this, but it should be noted, V out over V in is negative D divided by one minus D. So negative duty cycle divided by one minus the duty cycle. And you can see from this that for duty cycles that are less than 50%, this is going to um, buck. For duty cycles that are greater than 50%, this is going to boost. So as we talked about in the last one, negative output creates some unusual considerations. So as I said, we, one thing is just use that negative, use that negative voltage that's generated as the new ground. This creates an issue though, because a lot of times you're designing a circuit that is either connected to another circuit, like it's got a wire, it's got, you know, it's, it's, it's got a communication control interface that's connected to something else. And it kind of expects that they both have the same ground. Or, or what's more common is your circuit is complex and you have different parts of your circuit that are communicating with each other that are all powered by different voltages. And the only thing that's really necessary then is that they all have the same common ground reference. Well, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're using the ground signal as the positive potential in one region of your circuit, that becomes a really big issue. And there's a, and there's a couple uh, fixes for that. So one thing that we can do is this is, uh, this design here is a four switch buck boost converter. 
a four switch buck boost converter basically allow really what we're doing is we're flipping that output so we're we're able to flip that output so rather than generating a negative rail it's generating a positive or rather than generating a negative relative to the ground it's generating a positive relative to the ground so you can see um we can uh where, where are we charging it up so we are oh it doesn't show but basically we can easily um yeah so let me if we want to be consistent we would have a capacitor here um, but effectively we have we can charge this inductor the way we did before and then we can use this inductor to provide power to our output like that so so that's kind of the two cases that are not really necessarily clearly shown here but but um yeah so so we can add extra switches and and really any if you're just adding switches though if we want to add two switches to a circuit we can do all sorts of stuff if we want to do that right so i i never i've never really fully liked this solution it's it is something people do but i just don't like it that much it feels like cheating a little bit um but um but and again also sometimes we want that negative so so a buck boost converter the default buck boost converter is a great tool for providing a negative rail so if you if, let's say you have a circuit that's powered by five volts and you want to power an op amp and you want differential behavior in that op amp and maybe you want that op amp powered by plus or minus 15 volts well then the plus 15 volts you could easily make using a boost converter the negative 15 volts you could make using a buck boost converter which already is going to generate that negative voltage for you and that's a, that's a common thing people do they also quite often you'll see regulators sold that produce both so you'll see regulators sold that are meant to be connected to these external components to produce both a positive and a negative uh, signal. And typically, if, if all you're doing is if you're deliberately generating a negative uh, potential, you're very likely going to use this, this sort of buck boost configuration because it's simple. It's really simple and straightforward. There's another type of um, what is effectively a buck boost converter, and it's called a chute converter. A chute converter, one thing is different about a chute converter is it's, its primary energy storage element, instead of being an inductor, its primary energy storage element is a capacitor. So this capacitor is what holds this, as we do these switching events, rather than charging up an inductor and then dumping that inductor's energy to an output, we are now charging up a capacitor and then dumping that capacitor to an output. Here's the issue though. When you're using capacitors to store energy in a system that has voltage supplies, it's tough to do because these switching events with capacitors, if you have, let's say you wanna just charge up a capacitor with an input voltage. Well, you could switch and connect the input voltage to the capacitor, but then immediately you have this, you know, this massive inrush of current. You have this huge, you know, you're basically shorting your input when you just connect a capacitor to it. And there are circuits that kind of do that. One thing we don't talk about that I wish we had had time to talk about is switched capacitor circuits. Switched capacitor circuits are, are basically just that. You take a capacitor, connect it to a supply, charge it up. And then with a whole bunch of switches, again, using a whole bunch of switches is cheating, but with a whole bunch of switches, you can then put that capacitor wherever you want, including stacking, you can charge two capacitors and then stack one on top of the other and you've doubled your voltage. That is a legitimate way to boost a signal, which, a lot of people do it. They're called switched capacitor circuits. They're inefficient though. So, so touching, you know, taking a capacitor and touching it to another capacitor and having them share charges and then switching their configuration is inefficient. It's, it's always inefficient. But the other issue is it generates these transients which have massive currents for short periods of time, which is not good for anybody. So in a chute converter, these inductors, you can really think of these more as something that slows down this transition of current. So, the, so rather than just connecting an input voltage directly to a discharge capacitor, you're connecting it to a discharge capacitor through an inductor. And that's gonna mean that the current slowly ramps up. And then on the output, the current slowly ramps down. So if we wanna use a capacitor to store, you know, if this would be easy, if our input was a current and our output was a current, we could use a capacitor directly. We could just treat a capacitor like it was an inductor in the other topologies. But because most of the circuits we deal with have voltage supplies, we have to, we're gonna charge and discharge this capacitor through an inductor just so that we don't have these massive current spikes. And so the way a chute converter works is you have a, um, this initially this inductor is, um, 
sort of allowing current. I'm going to switch colors here. With purple. So initially this inductor is slowly allowing the current to flow to charge up that capacitor. And then also you have um, this circuit is being powered by the energy that was stored in this capacitor and this inductor here. So you have this little loop here and this little loop here operating and, and everything's, everything's increasing and decreasing slowly. Again, if, when, if we have an inductor that's in place to prevent massive current surges, and you know, inductors are great for current. They don't, they don't let current change quickly. They just slow ramp up, slow drop down. Everything's nice and smooth. Then you have current flowing around in this loop and that's gonna charge this capacitor up. And then once this capacitor gets close to charged up to this voltage here, then the current in this inductor is going to drop to zero. So, so if we had stored energy in that inductor, or if we're using it, if we think about it, it's better. It's better, in my opinion, to think about it as as slowing down the flow of current. But we're going to charge up this capacitor on this side using this inductor, or using this inductor as sort of a, a go-between between a voltage supply and a capacitor. And then what's going on here is we have a circuit here where current is still flowing to our load as a result of energy stored both in this inductor here and this capacitor. But again, um, so yeah. So, all right, now when we short this, when we short this connector here, now what happens is this inductor, which had gotten, you know, the closer we got to filling up, the closer we got to charging this capacitor, the closer this inductor got to having no current flow. So now when we short this, we are going to sort of start accumulating more stored energy in this inductor. And this capacitor, this potential that this capacitor had accumulated, this, this stored energy in this capacitor is now going to be distributed to the output capacitor, the output load, and it's got that inductor there to kind of, you know, sl again, slow things down, but also temporarily store energy. So, so we have, so we're, we're handing off we're handing energy to a capacitor through an inductor. We're handing energy from the capacitor to an output load and output load capacitor through another inductor to just kind of keep, so there's not, there's not these sort of rapid, massive switching events. Everything is sort of slow accumulation, slow transfer back, slow accumulation, slow transfer back. Um, okay, let me clean this up and see what I want to talk about. Now I gotta go back and look at my notes, okay. Yeah, so yeah, again, it uses that capacitor as the primary storage element. The inductors really are just, can be thought of as just keeping everything slow and smooth. And um, so one of the benefits of this is look at these two states with the switch open and closed. Current is flowing through these inductors constantly. So we're, so we're not cutting any of these off. We're, there, we don't have these big switching events with a chute converter. Everything is this slow, loosey-goosey, gradual change of energy on each end. So we're slowly discharging the energy in here. We're charging it back up. We're slowly discharging the energy here. We're charging it back up. The capacitor is doing a handoff in between. The benefit of a chute converter is these are very low noise. We don't have these, we, we, and we don't have any of this sort of nonsense, right? We don't have any of this sort of, these sorts of shapes in our, in our output, in our input or output. Everything in a chute converter is looking like this, right? Everything is, is, is smooth and, 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 and so it's a lot easier to keep these things clean. It's a lot easier in terms of a, this is an inverting uh, topology. So just like the buck boost, this tends to sort of produce a negative voltage relative to this, form of it produces a negative voltage uh, relative to the ground reference on the input source, but it's a, it's a smoother. It is a less noisy way of generating that. If uh, so, going back a little bit to this issue of the inverting, inverting behavior of these buck boost converters, a SEPIC, which is a single ended primary inductor converter, people pronounce it differently, CPIC, SEPIC, uh, I don't, I'll be honest, I'm on the spot. I should have looked up how to actually pronounce it. I don't know. I've only, I've heard people pronounce it different ways. I could be way off though. I'm, um, 
I mostly just see it written. So this is a way to do buck boost behavior without inversion. So this is an easy way to design a buck boost converter that, that produces a positive output relative to ground. I'm not going to I'm not going to go too much into this but it's the, sort of the same theme we've had with almost all of these in that you you know you're you're transferring energy back and forth between these inductive and capacitive energy storage devices um, in order to to you know whatever input whatever input voltage whatever output voltage you're intelligently regulating a duty cycle to to transfer energy from the input to the output and um, these are these have become extremely popular, mostly because of lithium batteries, so lith or lithium ion batteries, which will, the next lecture we talk a lot about that. But a very common voltage for digital systems is 1.8 volts, and 3.3 volts are very common voltages for digital systems, and that is right near the threshold of a lot of battery technology. So there's a lot of batteries that, when they're fully charged, they're 4.2, and when they're fully discharged, they're close to three. Or there's a lot of batteries where when they're fully charged, they're 1.8 volts. And when they're fully discharged, they're 1.2 volts. So whenever you have this situation where your, your supply energy is from a battery that its voltage drops as it discharges, and that transition, that drop passes right over the voltage you're trying to produce, this is usually where you'll see these converters show up a lot. So very, very popular design topology. I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the analysis too much. I'll probably screw it up if I tried. <laughs> Sometimes I got I need a bigger diagram if you really want to go into some of these. But one thing to note, a caution. This is a fourth order. So this is you have um, LC, LC transients across this design. It's a fourth order converter. These are very hard to control. So if you're if you have a feedback path, Quite often, these need a controller that can compensate for a fourth order circuit if you want to get high speed control. So, so the downside of this sort of a converter is it's not quite as good at dealing with rapid changes in output current or, or you know, rapid changes in output power draw. So usually you'll see these more often as like a front end that you know, you'll see it as a front end that sometimes then goes to a couple of additional linear regulators or something. Not always, I shouldn't say that. But they, these do suffer from, if you have a, a design at the other end that's being powered by this and it goes through a lot of rapid power consumption transitions, it can create voltage spikes or voltage drops. And so it's something to keep in mind. And unfortunately, this is typically, these are typically used in battery powered applications, which are also precisely the types of applications where you normally have things that turn off, that go to sleep, where they go from consuming milliamps of current to consuming microamps or nanoamps of current. So, yeah, but main benefit does not invert like the non isolated chute converter. Uh, but the output is pulsed. So, one issue is you, you don't get the you don't get the, the benefit of a chute converter is you don't have these pulses to the input at the input or output. You have a constant, constant transition of energy at both, both the input and output stages, not here. Uh, one thing that we need to talk about is isolated converters. So far, this whole issue that we have with this negative, you know, oh, it generates a negative voltage. And then students say, well, let's just use the negative as a new ground. And then it's like, okay, that should work. That should work. Except for, as we talk about, when you have multiple systems that are communicating with each other, where they're relying on a common ground reference. So if the ground reference for one is the high voltage reference for the other, it's going to be extremely difficult. You're going to have to eventually do something to, to send signals back and forth. And that's where isolated converters come in. Isolated converters have the benefit of you know, completely tossing out this issue of what's the ground reference, right? You can easily, with an isolated converter, Anything can be your ground reference. You're, you're, you're basically, you're producing a floating voltage. Your, your output is like, it's like a battery, right? You can take a battery, connect it to anything. The battery doesn't care. It'll always maintain a certain voltage across its terminals. You could plug it into something that's at a thousand volt potential and then walk over and plug it into something that's a 10,000 volt potential. And it's, it doesn't know the difference. It's isolated. It's not tied to any particular reference. It's just maintaining a voltage across the terminals. Isolated converters kind of do that. And what you see here is this is an isolated chute converter. So you have the, you know, basically you have the, the 
um, input stage of a chuk, the output stage of a chuk converter, and it's got a transformer in the middle. So the cool thing about switch supplies is we're generating a switching event, which usually means transforming is fairly easy to do. It's fairly easy to add a transformer step anywhere. And the nice thing about a transformer is transformer naturally provides isolation. The two coils of a transformer are physically isolated from each other. So what if we had a uh, volt, you know, this is our ground reference here. What if we wanted to build a chute converter with a transformer like this and we wanted it to be non-inverting? Super easy. All we have to do then is just tie these together, right? So if we, if we just physically connected these two, then now this terminal of this isolated supply is ground. We can do that now. We can, we can play whatever games with that we want with an isolated supply. So um, I talked earlier though about like sending signal. If you do have a portion of your circuit that's inverted and you're using the negative reference as your new sort of ground reference for this other portion of your circuit, how do you send signals back and forth? Opto isolation is, one, is typically the way you do it. So the idea here being just convert the signal into the optical domain, you know, have a have the your digital signal produce illuminate an LED, and then have on the other side of the, you know, your circuit that's powered by some weird inverted supply on one side, sending a digital signal which illuminates an LED. And then on the other side, you have a receiver that receives that signal, converts it back to a digital signal, boom. That's that's the basic of op opto isolation. And that's fine, you can do that. Power isolation is a little bit tougher. Power isolation usually needs transformers. Another way you can isolate signals is with, with what's called a pulse transformer usually, which is sort of like a little mini, it's kind of a low current transformer where if you send a pulse, it a pulse shows up on the other end of it, which you know, is fairly straightforward. A lot of times it's like, you know, you send a pulse and then on the other end of it, you kind of get, you know, sometimes you get kind of like, something weird or you know something a little weird but you know that can easily threshold detector you can clean that up to a normal digital pulse the, the main thing is you're getting a you're getting you're getting information you're getting pulses on the other end of a pulse transformer so that's another way to do isolation um yeah one one other type of isolation you'll do is if you're trying to drive a transistor that's on another side of a circuit Quite often you need to do that. And that's where pulse transformers are really good because you can send a pulse of current to a transformer. And then the other side of the, the secondary side of that transformer is also gonna see a pulse of current. And that, and it's easy to, with a pulse of current, it's easy to charge or discharge the gate of a MOSFET. So sometimes the challenge of turning on and off a switch on some other circuit through an isolation thing is as easy as just putting a pulse transformer in there. I ended up talking so much about pulse transformers. I probably should have just put a different, separate slide. Um, a, a, Converter that's become very popular recently is the flyback, well, not recently, it's been popular for a long time, is a flyback converter. A flyback converter is basically just a buck boost converter with a transformer. So previously we showed a chute converter with a transformer providing isolation. A much simpler circuit is the flyback, which is a buck boost that uses a transformer for isolation. And um, it's really simple. I mean, look at this, it's got one, two, three, components, three components, and you can produce an isolated power supply. Really nice, really convenient. Um, and one of, the, one of the most important things here is this, one of the cool things about flyback converters is a lot of intelligent controllers now can fully regulate the secondary side of a flyback converter only through feedback on the primary side. So in this case, this is, I don't know, I don't know LT8301, I don't know, I mean, some chip made by Linear Technologies and it uses a current sense resistor here. So it's sensing the current on the primary side and it's able to use that to keep a nice constant regulated output voltage on the secondary side. So, so this is a way to, to control an isolated power supply without ever having to touch the other side of it, which is handy, it's nice. Cause then you, your signal doesn't have to go through an opto isolator. Your signal doesn't have to go through any others. Sometimes you'll also have a, a second transformer. So you'll usually build it into the, uh, you'll see this quite often where you have a transformer that actually has four coils of wire. It has two big high current coils that actually do the power transfer. And then it has two extra lower current coils that send a signal back that, that tell the, the, the primary side what the voltage is currently at the output side, at the, at the secondary side. 
So that's another way to do it, but it's not necessary. You can do flyback converters using uh, just by doing sensing on the primary side. And it's it's it keeps these simple, keeps these cheap. And it's, this is a very popular way to, to do this type of isolated transformer. One, th one thing to be careful about though is when we talked about switching regulators, we talked about when they switch into discontinuous mode, it can be very difficult for these sort of isolated transformers without a feedback, without a, with only primary side feedback, it can be very difficult for them to tell when the output has gone into some kind of a very low current consumption mode. So it can be very hard for them to tell when they need to be operating discontinuous mode. They can do it, but it's not great. So a lot of times these will be rated with a minimum current at the output. So some of these isolated converter designs, in addition to having a maximum current of you can't draw more than 500 milliamps, you gotta be careful because a lot of times they'll say, oh, but also there's a minimum output current of eight milliamps. And what that means is if your output, if your secondary side has a current draw that falls below eight milliamps, then it's not necessarily regulating that correctly. So warning, that's something to look out for. And it usually happens in these kind of low cost converter designs. Uh, a forward isolated supply is, well, a forward isolated supply is, is if, if I told you to create an isolated supply with a transformer and I didn't tell you anything else, you didn't know any other design thing, probably what you would come up with is, well, let's just take a signal and chop it up with a MOSFET. So let's just take a signal and then chop it up and then run this through a transformer and then boost it up to the other side. And then on this other side, let's just do the normal business with it. Let's just rectify this and let's just do like a normal AC to DC conversion step on this output stage. That's an, that's a great solution. So, so take a DC, take, a, enter, take an input that's DC, chop it up to make it AC, run it through a transformer and then just do AC to DC conversion. Smart you. That's usually what students come up with if we tell them to come up with stuff. And that's very clever and that's very good. And that's a great way to use a transformer. And that's there's a name for that. And that is just, that is a forward isolated supply, which is basically just that. You'll see it described different ways, but I always like to think about it as it's just this simple chop up an input, chop up an input to produce an AC. And then, you know, what did we say at the very beginning of supplies? Why do we like AC? Because they're easy to transform. So the simplest thing to do is just chop up a DC to make an AC and transform it, and then just do the normal AC to DC after that. And that's what we're doing. I think I, I think I just said the same thing like five different times. I don't know why I'm repeating myself. But so so we did. Um, we talked about flybacks. We talked about forward. Uh, the, these are just some other designs for isolated supplies. We're not going to talk about them. These are these are the two big ones. What's the the forward, so maybe I should talk a little more about the forward isolated supply. What's good about it? Uh, the forward isolated supply tends to be a little more efficient than a flyback, or uh, so it tends to. It tends to be. It's easier to get these up into the 90, 95 percent efficiency range, which is usually not possible with the flyback design. What's the downside? They're more expensive. They're more expensive components. You have. You know, transformer, but you have two diodes and usually these two diodes are actually two MOSFETs if you don't want to have that that rectifier drop uh, inductor capacitor. So so whereas the flyback was just a transformer and a capacitor and diode, you have more components for the forward isolated supply, but uh, the flip side is the efficiency is typically greater. That does it, does that do it? Is that it? That's it, all right. So that's, this is the end of our forward isolated supply or the end of our discussion on DC to DC converters. You'll notice we didn't do a lot of examples in this and that's for a reason. This is just a topical, I'm, I'm not asking you to solve equations for these. I just want you to know they exist. I want you to know why do we need an isolated supply? Well, we need an isolated supply when, well, let me talk a little bit more about isolated supplies. So yeah, isolated supplies are a great way to deal with this issue of we generated a negative voltage. So if you if you generate, if you want to have a, a voltage where you can put it in whatever orientation you want, wherever you want, like a, treat it like a battery. Yeah, that's a great reason for an isolated supply. 
another time you see isolated supplies show up is when it comes to complex systems that have multiple parts where you cannot guarantee noise-free operation. You'll see this a lot with airplanes and cars and th these complicated electronic systems that span a very large area that have long wires running between them. Look at a car or look at a, a truck. Packar, the trucks they make have these CAN buses, CAN communication buses. Typically they'll have Nowadays, they'll have, you know, half a dozen to a dozen different CAN buses on a single truck. And each one of these buses has several meters of wire connected to it to connect all these different components. And every time you have a wire, it's picking up noise. And yeah, it's differential. It's a differential signal. But those two wires are still picking up noise as, as you know, they're going through it. It's, it's a truck. It's driving under power lines. It's got a bunch of electronics that are switching. It's got a motor that's rotating. It's turning a, it's turning a, a, a um, oh my gosh, <laughs> this alternator. <laughs> so it's generating all kinds of noise, all sorts of noise on these signals. There's a couple ways to deal with noise. One is we can shield everything and we can isolate everything and we can run these fat, low resistance, giant copper wires across our entire car to provide a nice, clean, consistent ground reference to everything. Or we can say, we can just give up and we can say, you know what? We're, we can't guarantee a clean ground reference anywhere in this car. Our ground is gonna be noisy all over the place. So instead of worrying about it, let's just say, whatever region of my car has a circuit that needs power, I'm gonna generate clean power at that region. I'm gonna control whatever microcontrollers I need at that region. I'm gonna do whatever communication I need at that region. But when I'm sending data from one, from one little, I don't know, fiefdom or whatever of my car to another, I'm just going to assume it's communicating on a noisy bus. And so, so for the portion of my circuit that puts data on that CAN bus, that portion of my circuit is gonna be powered by an isolated supply. So I'm gonna just keep it, it's gonna be floating out there and it's gonna be connected to this noisy mess of a bus and I don't care because it's gonna be isolated. And that's so you'll see that a lot where you'll see isolation done just because it's the only way to deal with what is potentially catastrophically devastating noise. You know, sometimes, I, you know, and, and you'll see this even on a smaller scale. You'll quite often you'll have, uh, you know, if you have, one system that's powered by one type of wall adapter, it could have a ground reference that relative to earth ground is jumping up and down 70 volts. And you could have another type of power supply that when it's plugged into the wall, it's producing an output that's isolated. And so in that case, who knows what its potential, its potential could be drifting up, up to space or you know, it could be, it could be going up to 10,000 volts. If you're touching it and rubbing your, rubbing your socks on a, on a carpet, you could be building up a huge electrical potential and nothing is keeping it tied to earth ground. So when you have all these different pieces of electronic equipment and all of them are connected to their own power supply and all of them have a ground reference, which who knows what that reference is, could be earth ground, could be a earth ground with a lot of noise, could be some, some other, you know, midway between the rails of the AC that's coming off the wall, who knows? But when they, when they talk to each other, when they talk to each other, you gotta have something that's driving the communication line, sending data each way, Quite often, a, an easy way to, to not even worry about any of this stuff is just have have that side of that side of the communication that sends the data and receives the data be so totally isolated, and so then then who cares? Okay, hopefully that made sense. These are topics are not normally covered in an undergraduate curriculum, but they're a huge portion of what a lot of you will probably do when you go work for a company, and. Keep in mind, we're not going into details about all of these. You might work for a company and they might say, all right, here's, you know, we, we're using a chute converter for this and here's why. And you'd say, oh, okay, I vaguely remember talking about chute converters in Professor Lund's EE320 class, but I don't remember well enough. So here, I downloaded all of his PowerPoint slides and I, oh, but better yet, I, his YouTube channel is still active, at least until he gets banned. At least until he gets banned from YouTube. So his YouTube channel is still active. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to look it up and then I'm going to look at his video and I'm going to say, you didn't really talk a whole lot about this, but I got the gist of it. And then I went and I did a little more research and I got a little more detail, but it's hard to predict, right? You might go your entire careers and never deal with a chute 
regulator, or you might work somewhere where every day you're dealing with a chook regulator. I don't know. I want you to know these things exist. I want you to know they exist. I want you to know the pros and cons. I want you to, in the future, be able to look up more information because you know that this, this technology, this concept exists in the first place. So thanks for watching. See you next time.